Session 3 and 4 taught by Dr. Reams and Black in 1977. This is tape 15, side A. Wednesday, 9.30 a.m. Session 3 and 4, Dr. Reams' Biological Theory of Ionization, held at Murrieta Hot Springs, California. Dr. Black dwells on Actohydria parasim doni. Theme day 6, slant 27, hyphen 7, slant 1, hyphen 7, 7. That will verify this statement that those people who do not get up in the morning and, quote, break their fast will have erratic sugar levels the entire day. Excellent thought. That's an excellent thought. Did you guys at the back hear that? One fellow up here in the front says that he, he realizes that that sugar erratic uh, behavior is going to be a problem during the day, and so he sets up his programs, of course, and keeps them eating a very, very light supper because he says then he knows they'll be hungry when they get up, and that solves the problem. Yes, doctor? On your alkaline, sh you mean your alkaline tide? Well, you want to... Well, yes, indeed, it can have an effect there because of the fact is that at certain times your body is being, for all practical purposes, anabolic in nature, okay? It's setting parasympathetically, and it's digesting, storing, building up, and everything else. And then you're going to have periods in which, of course, it's primarily catabolic in nature, in which it's going to be reestablishing, getting rid of waste, breaking down, flushing, and various other things. So, yes, there can be changes in the other numbers. But if, in fact, you develop a stabilized testing schedule within given parameters of each day for these people, you will eventually find out that, you know, everything blends across because the degree of lunar influence, the degree of cyclic influence on their body, uh, call it whatever you will, the, the fact that you are using the same time factor and the fact that the people are basically maintaining the same rhythm in their life will balance these factors out to give you a better idea of right where they are. Now, I've seen people tested. Uh, and they'd say, well, we'd you know, run two tests on them a day. So they would run a test on them on the way to work in the morning, for instance, and they would run a test on them coming back in from work at night. And they were just you know, stunned at the great difference in the two tests. Well, I don't think that it would take too much intelligence to realize why there would be that great of a difference in those two tests. See? So you have to hit kind of a medium. Now, Doc has mentioned it, and I've mentioned it, but a lot of people are still going wherever they want to and testing these people, and they can never find anything. And once you start graphing these numbers, it's pretty important that you do, that you do know where you're at. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on giving them a graph, run their own pH test in between tests? With you can. You can. That's a good suggestion. We experimented with it for a while and dropped it because we didn't have the time. Okay? What the gentleman up in front said is he said, what would be the the harm or would or could he get away from having to spend as much time with them by could he give them a piece of graph paper everything of this nature and could he have this graph paper uh, set out here with say eight o'clock nine o'clock ten o'clock etc on through the day and could he in fact uh, have them mark down above those hours uh, their pH of their urine uh, using this, uh, what is it, nitrogen paper, or some of these things, huh? What is it? Dehydrant paper. P hydrant. Okay. Anyway, could you in fact have them tape themselves so that if you came up with a, let's say at eight o'clock uh, uh, during breakfast, you might come up with a six eight. Uh, by ten o'clock, you may have uh, dropped down to the point where it is a a five nine, and by noon you may be back up again and uh, various other things, and that if you suspicioned it, let them run the tests on themselves, bring that back into you, and then you pick off a area that you're going to say is a norm, 6-4, and have you graph this thing, and determine from this graph what the uh, alkaline tide is in a daily period for these people. Sure, you can do that. There would be no reason why not. We started it for a while, um, We and uh, we I gave it up because I just didn't have the time. I mean, you know, God, I was just, it just couldn't, I, I just couldn't pull it off. That's the next word. You just led into the next word, achlorhydria. Okay, Joe up in the front 
says that he's been doing that, and he says that some people show a stable pH all day long. And that's the next word, the achlorhydria people. In other words, those people who have diminished production of hydrochloric acid. These people won't have an alkaline tide. And this is one of the simplest ways to determine if, in fact, you should add into the diet betaine hydrochloric acid or some other aid to help the initial stage of digestion. That's the next word, Joe. That's the quickest way to find out if you've got a achlorhydrate a person. They're just, they won't have a noticeable alkaline tide. They'll just pretty well group all around wherever they normally are relative to what perfect is, which is 6-4. If they're sitting there, say, at a 5-9, at a they may jack around to a 6-1 or to a 5-7, and they may play around that particular area, but they'll stay just where they normally lay. And when you see that suspicion that the hydrochloric acid production in the stomach is diminished, and uh, consider then uh, putting them on betaine hydrochloric acid, and when you do, you will begin to see a alkaline tide starting to form on the chart in the vast percentage of cases, unless, unless you are dealing with a person who is so energy deprived that they have that their adrenals have shut down to the point where that they are now stabilized at a given pH. And of course, if they are, then if you can't get these adrenals functioning to the point where that they're starting to uh, do what they're supposed to, the general, the general rule will be that they will gradually slip more and more acid, and finally the saliva pH will go more and more acid, and then delta cells will become more and more prominent, energy will be more and more lost, and um, then you've really got a fight on your hands. There was a hand up somewhere. Who was it? Was it you? Okay. Surprisingly enough, you can have a swing of one full number above or below where they normally would graph or balance. It's not if you've got a uh, if you've got a person who say normally sets around a six two, it's not impractical to believe that they may graph seven two or may graft as low as five two in their swing. Now on a hyperchlorhydria person. That is unbelievable. I have seen these people right after a heavy meal. I've seen them go to eight, eight one, eight two, and three or four hours later, I've seen them down the fives. It's really amazing how far these hyperchlorhydrate people will swing. But uh, it's, uh, it's you can follow them through. Yes, my good man. There isn't, and there should be. And the point is, is that we cannot seem to, we cannot, from the research that we've managed to do up to date, um, we find that too very, very frequently that these people have a lock saliva pH. It's syrupy or bubbly or very diminished, and um, there's a lot of ionization factors, and the gland is not functioning well, or adrenal stress is keeping glandular function very minimal. And we've had people, Doc says that you should see the saliva changing in approximately anywhere from two weeks to four weeks, or in a 30-day period of time, you should see enough stress coming off of the liver and various other things and off of the organ systems to see this pH shifting. Well, he made the statement that it was evidence that the liver was detoxifying. It's not. It's evidence that the adrenals are finally picking up more balanced function so that the liver and the kidneys and the thyroid and the pituitary can tend to balance the internal structure, the internal harmony. Anyway, we're finding too many of these people that their pHs are locked, and until we get in there and uh, do something about the adrenal stress picture, uh, we don't see any significant change on them. Or we will find people that as their stress load changes from day to day, their saliva pH will change from day to day, depending on how much of a hit you're putting on the adrenals. So we can't come up with, we've, we've been graphing every one of them, and all we're getting is many, many spots on the paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've run an alkaline shift on people who have been sitting in the 6266 range in between there. And the alkaline, huh? Yeah, depending on how on how effective their stomach acid is. But yes, you can see them go up uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, even 1 in either direction. And even with a healthy pH, even with a healthy pH, you have to take into consideration personal attitudes. Because if you take a person and really get them mad about something, really blow their top, They'll swing alkaline for a while for some reason. Okay? Yes? 
I've seen a few of these. I've seen a few of these, and there is a reasoning behind it. And it also is a, and I was going to talk about it a little bit later. Let's talk about it now since you ask it now, all right? This is also evidence of an achlorhydria because what is happening is, is that they are starting out and eating their food, and their food is laying in their stomach so that they're throwing lunch in on top of the biggest part of breakfast. And then they're throwing supper in on top of the biggest part of lunch. How many people in this class at one time or another have sat down to supper because it's supper time, full well realizing that they're still full because they had a late lunch, but since supper was fixed, you ate it anyway. You see what I'm saying to you? Okay, now this is something that you'll see on these people, and you'll see them starting off in the morning because during the night they've gotten rid of a lot of amino acid and protein breakdown residues, and their body has been gummed up, and their kidneys have been producing a lot of ammonia during the night, and a lot of ammonia has been produced in the... and. Uh, and ammonia nitrogens have been produced and in the liver, and they in turn have been shunted over to the kidneys, and uh, you're uh, getting a more uh, so-called acid-type reaction because your nitrate nitrogens tend to be alkaline producers, see? But you're sleeping, so your kidneys are catching up. You wake up in the morning, you're acid, and then you keep packing food in all day long faster than your body can handle it, and you'll just start an upward drift because you'll go into an alkaline shift, or, and uh, not be able to uh, come down out of it. And then at night you'll catch up again. Okay, so what you've got is, is you've still got an alkaline shift, it's just extended because of their eating habits. As a general rule, as a general rule, I have heard this on, from a number of different people. I've never seen it in print yet, but it would be interesting to check it. As a general rule, they say that the average American could do better on one-third the amount that he eats each day. Now, I've heard that made by a number of people who are supposedly fairly knowledgeable. Okay. Huh? Okay. Um, I haven't had a chance to Well, there's several ways on that. We'll swing back on that in a little bit. Okay, there was another question back there. Pertain hydrochloric acid. It's just a it is uh, just a preparation put together that when swallowed, it's in small tablets and you take two, three, whatever the bottle tells you and it increases the stomach acid. Well, it's made from hydrochloric acid, but it has been complex to the point where you're not using the same hydrochloric acid you use for a reagent. Okay, in other words, it's mediated or it is, modded, uh, or it is uh, uh, modified to the point where that, you know, that you're not taking pure acid into your stomach because if you were, you'd burn the tongue and, and uh, esophagus getting it there, see? Yeah, if you let it dissolve, okay? Yeah, you can see alkalosis in the eye pattern, which is that around the periphery you tend to see a, a gray shading in around the eyeball, Okay, usually on the sides and the lower part and around. Uh, you can also depend very, very frequently on whether or not they are acid or alkaline by noting their skin. Okay, in fact, some of you, one person asked me last night, they said, well, you said to watch for oils and deodorants and various other things if you were going to take a pH test on someone's body. I said, where would you test it? If you've got a pH, if I, they said, I've already got a pH meter. He said, where would you go on the body to test uh, sweat? Okay, and of course the answer to that's off the back because the back is the least frequently washed thoroughly. Many people, you know, even in a shower, you know, they get this and they get that and the in-between never gets it. And also the back, the ventral skin or the dorsal skin uh, tends to uh, be a, a greater indicator uh, in general than does the areas around the armpit or in the, even if you were to test sweat on the side uh, You know, you're still getting a mixture of ionization coming from the African glands under the under the uh, arms the same way if you were testing from the leg for instance if you were going to touch their leg you could still get uh, African uh, Indications from the groin area and stuff of this nature and of course so I, I, I'd mentioned to them on the back but you can usually tell you can usually tell on the person's back or shoulders whether or not they're alkaline or acid by the skin, uh, where you cannot on the arms frequently because of the factor that they've used a lot of alkaline soaps and stuff of this nature, okay? You can't tell from the scalp either because of their, quote, shampoos, pH balanced and various other things. But you can check that. Now, the next thing that you can do, 
that will even give you a, a closer idea, and that is, is to find out if these people tend to be a sympathetic override as a base nature or a parasympathetic override as a base nature. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on this morning, and that will give you even a, a greater degree of, uh, of understanding as which way they've went. Yes? No, it does not. It turns to citric salts, which are alkalizing. That is one of the reasons why that in very, very high alkaline people, you don't give them large amounts of lemon juice because of the fact is that you can wipe them out with it. She said, does um, lemon juice turn into hydrochloric acid in the stomach? And I said, no, it does not. It turns into citric salts. And uh, so anyway, when we, up in our area now, if we have people who are highly alkaline, we put them on cranberry juice. We don't even touch lemon juice until we get that alkalinity down to a point because um, of the fact that uh, we have found very frequently if we take a highly alkaline person and we put them on four ounces of lemon juice a day that we really, really fatigue them and that we don't do a thing for changing that pH. It just sends the set up there. So we put them on those elements that will tend to acidify them. Another thing that will acidify them is a couple of tablespoons of, of cider vinegar. Now, it has to be cider vinegar, not distilled grain vinegar, okay? So you can go down to a health food store and a couple tablespoons of cider vinegar, and a glass of water in the morning, also apple juice, uh, grape juice uh, will also be things that they can utilize when they're setting way, way up there on their alkalinities, and this will help them tend to kind of uh, swing it uh, in a downward position, and of course then colon therapy and uh, things of this nature also assist. Hmm? What are you saying? Oh? Will you? Will you? Did you ever stop to think that, um, that many of the hypoglycemics running around in this country today are really evidence of hypersensitivities, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with their sugar mechanism. It's what they're triggering their mechanism, and if they happen to have high adrenal stress causing that alkalinity, they're going to have hypoglycemic symptoms anyway, okay? So if you can, if you suspicion you've got a true hypoglycemic, then you can still work them down, but you're going to have to experiment at their tolerance load, all right? But now I've had hypoglycemics tell me that they cannot eat any type of, uh, any type of sugar or fruits or various other things, and yet for months, and Charlie's back there at the back and have watched it on a lot of different cases, we have had hypoglycemics that were going into a slump. We've had them nibble pieces of dried fruit, either apricots, peaches, uh, are the two we primarily use, or dates. And we can take hypoglycemics and have them nibble dried fruit and balance them out much more quicker than we can by giving them a piece of goat's milk cheese and a cracker. Okay? So it, a lot of these hypoglycemics, I told you right from the very, very first that hypoglycemia isn't a disease, it's a symptom. So it's merely a matter of finding what's the underlaying. Hmm? The true hypoglycemic is still a symptom. It's still a symptom. It's not a disease. It's a symptom of some underlying metabolic disorder. Yeah, but that's an altogether different condition. If you've got a cancer in there and every other thing, that's not a metabolic disorder. That is a, that is a true pathology. Okay? Yeah, and in that particular case, son, the point of it is, is that working, working with them strictly on diet is not going to have, in many instances, a significant effect because of the energies being produced by the growth and various other things. Okay. Well, I'm just going by all that information that's available, uh, you know, as far as we can find. And many of the things when we initially put the diet book together, I sat down with Doc and I found, I so said to Doc, I said, well, Doc, what have you found? What's your opinion? Where does it go? Where is it coming from? And Doc has made statements to me, you know, relative. Well, I do this and I do that. And um, as we have uh, repeatedly tried to follow his program letter to letter, we have noted that Doc changes his program uh, from time to time as he sees fit. And uh, anyway, one of the things is, is how many of you have ever had Doc in your area that did a reading for you and told you to take two algavim and two chaparral and two men call and two this and two that after you had a test run? Has any of you ever had that happen to you? Okay, Annabelle, Margot, all right. Never once did he ever do that at the retreat. You came into the retreat and he fasted you or put you on a light diet, and then if he had, did fast you, you went on a light diet, 
and he normalized your physiology, and when you were ready to go home, he figured what your minerals were. He didn't figure your minerals at the retreat off of the first test, because it, you see what I'm saying? Huh? That's correct. You were at the retreat. I remember you being there. Okay, so some of the things that we have taken, that we have researched through, and we just can't verify it. We've done everything we can, and we can't verify it. We've gotten, that we've, you know, I've even pulled on a few other people's ears that are knowledgeable in the country on nutrition and, you know, said, is there any way that I can get information on this? And they've sent me things, and they can't verify it. And one of the things is, is that, of course, Doc says to use Cal-2 on low pHs and Cal-lactate on high pHs. And believe it or not, I've got some people that we're running tests on right now that their pH will uh, stay low, 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 and low on a Cal-2 and switch them over onto a Cal-lactate, and it'll swing up. Yeah, but these people here can't, so we have to come up with certain base parameters to give them a the biggest percentage, you know, from what we can verify and what we can come up with that will help them and to give them some indications. So we're finding out some things, and for instance, for instance, I watched for a long, long time, and Doc would tell me that every time I had a low pH to give these people vitamin A, D, lime water, and everything, and yet when I'd see Doc with it working a low pH, he was given ferrotonic. Huh? He said what? Yeah, but I've watched Doc repeatedly take low pH people and give them nothing but ferrotonic, no lime water or anything else, and it works. And so anyway, why sometimes Doc, I think, has tried to simplify this to the point is that, that you know, that uh, you can go too specific and it fits only a limited number of people, or you can go too general and it misses the big percentage. So that's the reason why that I've spent the time and effort trying to go through all of this stuff and trying to figure out and trying to verify where he's coming from and stuff of this nature, and we're finding areas that we can't verify. We're sure trying. What? No, I brought that up in the second course, and in the second course that I taught, these people were all handed 120 pages of food facts that are fairly well established, okay? And this was brought up at that particular time, and I said at the time we first started this, we were using Doc's base information. We've since found out that some of these things don't work accordingly, and to make, you know, as you watch these people and everything like that, uh, to read through there and to reestablish, and that there's three or four of them in there that you may want to look at, but even used in reasonable small quantities. And anytime you use fruit juice, it should be in reasonably small quantities. Most people think that it's okay to eat one orange or to want, drink one 10-ounce glass of orange juice, failing to realize a 10-ounce glass of pure orange juice is seven or eight oranges, and maybe even be a dozen oranges. And you know that your system's not geared to eat a dozen oranges in one fell swoop in a minute and a half that it takes to get it down your throat. So anyway, I told them to limit their juice intake, and if they're using juices, to swing more toward the vegetable broths and the vegetable juices and things, and that uh, if, in fact, if they did get a small amount, two, three, four ounces, of a juice that might in fact be alkalizing, that the overall effect during the course of a day would not be that noticeable a change. You're not going to see the pH go bananas from that particular response. But all of the people who've had the second class under me should be, anyway, using this 120 pages to uh, determine um, uh, the digestive rate of some of these foods, to develop low-stress diets that are easily assimilated, to, de to figure the high-energy foods, to figure the foods that are high mineral content, to food, figure the foods that are cover foods, to figure the uh, uh, foods, you know, that they can effectively slide in there wherever they want to go. Uh huh? I, I remember the doctor who said that if something's amplified, that's illegal. Well, no, I haven't either because a banana will change. A green banana will go from, uh, what is it on the banana? Does it go from alkaline to acid? No, it goes. Yeah, but the banana changes its pH as it turns ripe. Which way does it go? It goes acid to alkaline? Okay, the green banana goes acid to alkaline when it's ripe. Well, I don't either, but if you can find out anything, please let me know. I'd love to hear about it. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay, if you can find that, why, please let us know. It would be very interesting. Well, they were to those people in the second class. No, I don't carry a bunch of them around with me, okay? The fact of the matter is, when I came out here this week, why, well, I got out here and unpacked and found out, I, you know, that I had uh, left two-thirds of the things that I would have liked to have had because of the hurry in getting out here. But uh, you can write me, and I can tell you where I got them. Uh, 
or uh, if I've got any, why you're more than welcome to them. Well, yeah, give me a, drop me a note then at home. Let's go in now to the next thing. And I lost my pencil. Did anyone see what I did with it? Where did I do with it? Oh, here. Okay, I got it. Now, the next thing to take into consideration is our signs of parasympathetic dominance. And, um, huh? Yeah. On your parasympathetic dominance. Now, one of the, we'll go over some of these things with you. And very, very frequently, your diet plan doesn't work because you feed a, you feed a diet plan to these people uh, who carry a dominance uh, without taking into consideration that the dominance exists. So it would be nice to discuss every bit of this, you know, right from day one. Uh, but most of the people don't want to stay in class for the first 30 days. Uh, so, you know, we start as simple as we can and then gradually bring you to a better and better understanding for those that do not respond as further up. And on a number of things that we have found in recent, um, uh, in recent months, why um, right now, anyway, Doc is uh, uh, pretty much uh, in total disagreement with us. So we have to sit down and explain it to Doc and go through it with him and everything else and show him where we're coming from. Uh, but this is something that's fairly well established. Uh, it has been established for a long time, in fact. In fact, it was known during the early part of the 1900s that you can, in fact, have a person who is parasympathetically dominant or sympathetically dominant, and it appears that it is generated in the uterine existence. Okay? It appears that the baby has the dominance established at birth. And so it, in fact, would work as what Lynn refers to as inherent weakness. It would almost be an inherent weakness in the system. You're going to have to feed away from this dominance uh, throughout the course of the life. Now, you can come in with a minus person or a plus person, too, that we won't discuss at this particular time, but that's you can read on it, and that's fairly well established, too, that there is evidence that there are people listed as minus individuals or plus individuals. It has nothing to do with whether or not they're failures or winners. It has to do with how their metabolism functions. But anyway, on parasympathetic dominance, you will very frequently have hypothyroid condition. Of course, you can test that to get an idea now whether or not the thyroid is a little weak. There will also frequently be hypogonadal uh, tendencies. And quite frequently you have a, a kind of a general flabbiness or loss of tone in these people. And in men, more so than in women, as they are coming up through their early or their formative years, they usually, especially the children of today and even in my generation, they tend to be so active or they tend to be so vain relative to their appearance and everything uh, that even though they have a parasympathetic dominance, uh, they'll starve themselves, just literally starve themselves in an, in an effort to keep the weight down. And on the male, uh, it tends to work. But many of you have known a lot of females young girls who are parasympathetic dominance, and they literally eat nothing to speak of, and yet lose absolutely no weight either. Have any of you met any of these people in your testing? And yet these people come to you, and they say, my God, I'm on the program. How come I'm not losing any weight? So the first thing you have to do then is to go back and determine if you've got a parasympathetic dominance, because if you do, you're going to have to feed the dominance, uh, or going to have to feed them away from the dominance. Okay, now... Very, very frequently, these people have problems with oh, hay fever, uh, sinus problems, uh, other allergies, uh, swelling eyes, and this, this swelling eyes seems to show up again more frequently in the female than it does in the male, you know, and the, it really bothers the woman. You know, the guy can always laugh it off. Someone says, wow, what happened to you? They can say, oh, I was drunk last night or something, you know, and get away from it. But the woman, it really bothers her because of the fact that now the modern approach to makeup and everything much more firmly accentuates the eyes than it did years ago when the cheeks, the eyebrows, and the lips were more prominently displayed with makeups. You remember the bow uh, years ago, you know, the little heart-shaped, uh, lips, the bright, brilliant red lipsticks 
that was just like glue. You got it on your collar, you could throw the shirt away. And uh, you got it on your collar and you were married, you'd better throw the shirt away. <laughs> but anyway, this, uh, again, the swelling eyes seems to be a problem uh, with, these, uh, with women more so than with men. Uh, you find that the liver is uh, very, very sluggish on these people. Liver is very, very sluggish on these people. And um, it's, very, it's quite frequently very, very difficult to get the nitrate nitrogens uh, down, and sometimes it's difficult to get the nitrate nitrogens and ammoniacal nitrogens down. And you'll see these people very, very frequently because of the fact that you'll put them on a fast and a three-day light diet and you'll get them down to the point where here they've got ureas of, say, 5 over 4 or 3 over 3 or something. You think, whoo, got that problem whipped. And the first day they go back on food, they shoot right back up to 10 over 10. Had anybody that's ru that you've run into like this? Yeah. Just first day you put them back on food, zap, they're right back up there. Uh-huh. Wait till I get done telling you what it is. I'm telling you what it is right now so that you can recognize it. Then we'll discuss some of the things that you might want to consider relative to their diet. Is that what you're after? Give me time then. Okay? Now another thing is, is that surprisingly enough on these people, very, very frequently you'll have low blood pressure. And you see these women, you know, that are pretty flabby and pretty overweight, uh, especially that are sitting there with low blood pressure. Now a lot of times the, the men may be in exactly the same boat but the man has a tendency, man has a tendency to carry a little bit higher blood pressure than a woman does, and so the man may be grossly overweight and way more flabby than he should be, and yet he brags about the fact that he's got normal blood pressure. You see? He's just a parasympathetic dominant, and if he was in, a, in, in reality relative to where he should be with that weight, his blood pressure is really below normal, it's just normal relative to that arbitrary 120 over 80 that someone thought up. Okay? Now you also have a problem that you have a lot of colon stasis with these people. They have problems with um, oral constipation or they have problems with the, uh, they'll have bowel movements and after they've had the bowel movements the lower part of the rectum still feels full. They still feel uncomfortable. They feel like they haven't completed the bowel movement, but yet there's uh, uh, no way, you know, that any more is going to be uh, ejected from the bowel. And these people usually tend to have the characteristic uh, pattern of bowel stasis too, which they come down as far as the abdomen and then have the characteristic bulge in the lower part. This is the umbilicus here going on down. And, okay, so they tend to have this characteristic bulge in the lower part of the abdomen right here. Okay? Keep in mind, fellas, you didn't pay for my artwork. Okay? <laughs> All right? Now, another factor that you have to take into consideration is, is that if you test it, these people will always have an alkaline fecal mass. In other words, the, the fecal substance will be all anywhere from seven on up. And it's not uncommon to find seven fours, seven sixes. They tend to, they are, the bowel tends to be more alkaline. Of course, the colon therapist, you know, picks up on that pretty quick. And he picks up on the fact that there's a good possibility that there's a little friend living up there. Okay? Hmm? Well, wait till I give you the sympathetic on the other side, hon, and then you'll see where the middle is, okay? Now, you've got a, another factor here. And that is, is that these people, uh, these people, very frequently the women will have late uh, maturation or they will have uh, late onset of uh, menses. Okay? And very, very frequently you will find these women having a rather notable, more excessive flow. You will also find these people having trouble with uh, edema, especially when they get a little bit older in life. Ankles swelling, knees swelling, feet swelling, the dependent limbs show up more frequently. And these people start talking about 
you know, be cool all the time or cold all the time. Difficult to get them warm. And when you check them, you're liable to find that the temperature is just a little bit subnormal. You'll tend to find that these people love carbohydrates. These people really dig their carbohydrates. These people like their breads and their pastries and their soda pops and uh, stuff of this particular nature. You'll also find that they have a tendency to have more problems with the mouth, such as all oh, sore gums, receding gums, pyorrhea, uh, cold sores, uh, herpes, the so-called canker sore. They tend to have a little bit more problem. And you can see a parasympathetic dominant person as her system starts to become just a little bit more alkalizing uh, as she comes close to her period and she'll show up with canker sores every month, regular as clockwork. You ever run into any woman like that that's just cyclic as could be? Every month they'll have a canker sore or two. Now is the time to turn tape over. Now do you tell Jesus to love him. Hallelujah. He loves you.